Do you think this is the toughest fight you had so far in Tiruvannathapuram? No, the toughest fight I had in Tiruvannathapuram was undoubtedly 2014. I mean, got to the point where both my opponents' parties yeah. were going door to door saying, how can you vote for this guy? He murdered his wife. We are on the road in Tiruvannantapuram with our special series, The Dhabas of Democracy. All behind me, you can see the convoy of Shashi Tharoor. Even at this late hour of the night, the campaigning is on. He's taking no chances because this time he's up against a very high profile candidate. He's up against Union Minister Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Now, the BJP took 31% of the vote share last time. And this time, the BJP is hoping that maybe Tiruvananthapuram won't choose Shashi Tharoor again for a fourth time. And that the BJP will finally be able to make its debut in Kerala, make its opening here in Tiruvananthapuram. What does Shashi Tharoor think? Well, we'll find out in a moment. It's almost 10 p.m. and we're here on the campaign trail with Shashi Tharoor. They say it's third time lucky, but will it be fourth time lucky for him in a battle that's been called the Clash of the Titans as Rajiv Chandrasekhar, Union Minister, goes up against Tharoor, who's hard at work even at this time of the night. Shashi, uh, you know, when you were in college and we, I was in college, there used to be a debate called Clash of the Titans. Is that how you see your clash with Rajiv Chandrasekhar? Well, I suppose both of us in different ways ought to be flattered to be called a titan. In my case, uh, this is just my fourth term, but it's... Uh, an interesting challenge in the case of uh, our friend Rajiv, he's fighting for the first time for the Lok Sabha and seeking a popular mandate. So is he yet ready to be baptized as high? But do you feel as someone who's fighting your fourth election that this will be your toughest election yet? Not, not, not from the evidence we've seen on the ground so far. I've been campaigning since my candidacy was announced on the 10th of March. Uh, that's been almost five weeks now. And I can tell you that uh, the feedback, the reaction from the public shows that we are well ahead and that there's a tremendous amount of, of, of affection and, and recognition that they've given me, which I believe will continue and which reflects the kind of faith and trust they placed in me in the past. Okay, I'm going to let you just say uh, hello to all the people here. You can see uh, there are people on the sides of uh, Shashi Tharoor's uh, Vahanam, as it's called. And uh, we will be talking a little more to him. He has to periodically stop and talk to uh, his voters, of course. Uh, let me ask you this as you, as you greet uh, the citizens in this constituency. And like I said, it's uh, elections are really the hustle and bustle of it are alive, uh, even in at this time of the night. Are you confident that you're going to win a fourth time or a little bit nervous given that the BJP took 31% of the vote share last time? So the BJP became second twice, yes. both last time and the time before. But last time my majority was a good 11%. And the most recent survey by the most uh, uh, popular Malayalam newspaper, the Malayalam Manorama, uh, is also putting me 11% ahead of uh, the BJP. So it doesn't look like at the moment I must still worry about. We haven't picked up the sense that there is any major problem here yet. But, you know, there are almost two weeks to go and people are going to campaign to the very end. We'll see how things are going. I'm not worried at all. In fact, my 
self confidence has grown in the time that i've been campaigning okay uh, we are going to let uh, shashi uh, meet his voters they're all lining up by the side of his vahanam uh, and we're here following him on the campaign trail when this convoy stops we will try and have a more reflective conversation with him then but for now shashi tharoor is saying he's not nervous his confidence has only grown we'll see him in a moment when this convoy is started Well, this is the Dhabas of democracy, so it won't be complete without a meal. And uh, Shashi Tharoor has kindly agreed to eat with us after a long day of campaigning. It's well past 10 p.m., but clearly Tiruvananthapuram is the place for a bustling nightlife. Uh, this is the, ironically, the Sakhab or the Comrade Dhaba, uh, known for a legion of communists who have eaten here. That's so right. So I've got to start with saying, how ironic is that? Oh, it's, it's a deliberate choice. Now these guys are pretty good, and they also stay open late at night. We're not that much a late night place, and you and I are coming back from the coastal belt. Correct. We have been in the area, uh, or the the coastal areas, not the five star areas of Kovalam, but the fishermen's villages. And coming back from there, this is a town called Balramapuram, which is halfway between here and Tiruvannamalai. Okay. And Balramapuram, we know this place stays open late, so that's why we suggested it. But the the Sakhar Hotel, as they call themselves, the Sakhar Hotel or the Comrade Hotel, is actually the place where Yemis Namudri Pad and Achyuta Menon and all the legendary communist leaders have eaten. Well, we are getting the legendary banana leaf mat. That's right. Uh, and I still am stuck by the I'm still stuck by the irony that uh, your vahanam was kind of a shade of red. We are <laughs> no, no, eating at a, we are eating at a Comrade Hotel. Are you actually a secret commie? <laughs> <laughs> Not the way the commies have been abusing me during this election. I don't think anyone would doubt that for a minute. They've really been spending all their energies attacking me. Ah. I asked for a thin dosa. You're going to get a oh. thick one. Okay, so we are going to uh, be looking at. A, uh, you're eating a. Uh, this is a thin dough. This is actually not what the the dhaba normally specializes in. Yeah. They specialize in the ones that they're serving those guys. Look around. Okay. You see the, the see the see the round fat. So one. I hope I hope I'm going, round round fat fat one I'm going prefer? to get the round see, fat see one. See what he's carrying. So I have to I have to yeah I can see it now. You so you're going to tell me all about these dosas in a moment. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to so be eating. So we're going to be eating. We are going to be eating a dosa dinner. Ha. Okay. This is coconut chutney. Little please. Please start, Shashi. I know you're famished, but I have to ask you about yeah, this yeah. ironic moment that mm. we're at a at a dhaba known for the number of communists who ate here, and named also comrade. Mm. Um, one second. I'm just going to let him settle down. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that now we're in a constituency mm. where, of course, you're going head to head. No, no. He has to come from that side. You're going head to head with the BJP, but yeah. you're also pretty angry with the left. Why are you angry with the left? See, the, um, oh, this is delicious. The fact is that the uh, left is a significant factor in the election. They're not big players or minor players. They're a um, significant factor. They had held the seat in the two elections before I held it. Yeah. The communist seat. Yeah. I took it from them. And then um, in 2014 and 2019, the BJP uh, surged ahead of that. A chaya kitte viru the data. By the way, before we get into politics, I want I want to show off my dosa. Being a Punjabi North Indian, we don't get this in Delhi. So so this is a regular. So this dosa. is what am I having? I want the camera to, 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 to see a tattu dosa. A tattu dosa, ha, which is a me, what is it? And dhaba dosa. A dhaba dosa. So basically, unlike the thin sagar type dosa that we eat in Delhi, this is like a pancake almost. But this is what I'm having is a thin dosa. Can I prefer? Which you prefer? So yeah. you're being healthier than I am. Not healthier. But no, no, is, no. I'm just being um, absolutely delicious. Less rustic than you are. Just a bit. I'll try. I'll try. Okay, one more bit. Okay. So to come back to the communists. Hmm. Now. Why couldn't you all reach it? I understand the local politics are left versus Congress in Kerala, but a triangular contest doesn't help the opposition against the BJP right now, does it? 
Well, the problem is that in India, as you know, Barkha, elections are not just national general elections. De facto, they're also elections taking place in 29, 30 states. Mm. I don't mean for state assemblies, I mean at the national level. Yeah. Because each state has its own history, it has its own political issues, and its own political combinations and rivalries. So, what you've got now is... What you've got now is a situation where the Congress and the Commies yeah. have been leading rival fronts and been alternating in power for the last 55 years. Mm. Um, we now have this um, unprecedented situation where we didn't, didn't manage to turf them out. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Mm. In the last election, so therefore they, they're on a second consecutive term. Mm. But otherwise, it's been alternating every five years. Now, in those circumstances, there's no way these two parties are ever going to agree mm. to fight on the same side in any election together mm. in Kerala. Mm -hmm. But right next door in Tamil Nadu, the same party, CPM, CPI, Congress, Muslim League, which is our ally here, yeah. and the DMK are all together. There's no issue. There's no debate. So it's merely because the political realities in each state are different. Yeah. That's the story. But, okay, we'll talk about the left after a moment. Let's talk about Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Yeah. The BJP got 31% of the vote share last time. It was the number two party. Mm -hmm. It was the number two party in the election prior. Mm -hmm. They're really hoping that they're going to make an opening with Tiruvannathapuram. And they're counting on the fact that while three times is lucky, fourth time is an achievement. <laughs> it's rare for a politician to face no public anger or anti incumbency. And they're counting on the fact that, you know, they're using words like fatigue. They're saying Shashi Tharoor is absent. He's more in Delhi than he's in Tiruvannathapuram. This is what they're saying. <laughs> what do you say? Well, I'm not suggesting that I'm somehow immune to anti-incumbency, but I am pointing out that I've already broken the record for the longest serving MP Tiruvannathapuram has ever had mm -hmm. since the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that's because um, the only other MP to have served three terms, one of his terms is the one and a half year term. Yeah. That 89 to 91 period. Mm -hmm. So, the result is that I'm looking at an opportunity in many ways um, to demonstrate that as long as you do work and you work sincerely and you're effective, you don't have to be a victim of anti-incumbency. It's as simple as that. And I'm uh, amused by all this talk of mine not being here enough because I have averaged 10 days a month in the constituency every year. And when Parliament is in session, I unfailingly am in Delhi Monday to Friday and Saturday and Sunday in Tremble. Hmm. The other thing is that my social media is testimony to how active I've been when I'm here. I'm constantly running around, constantly doing events, constantly making speeches all over the constituency. So I'm not particularly worried about that charge sticking. Then, I think Shabdi Sheikh was hardly ever been in Trivandrum in the last 15 years. He's tried this charge of saying, he's done no work, I'm going to come and perform. The truth is, I've done so much work uh, for the development of, the, of, of Trivandrum that I actually have issued a 66-page report uh, laying out everything I've done in the last 15 years, just to serve as a reminder also, because memories are short in politics. And um, that seems to have silenced that argument quite a bit. In fact, I'd love to know whether, having been an MP from the Rajya Sabha from Karnataka for 18 years, whether he can point to half as many achievements for his state, then state as, as, as I can for my own constituency. So you're, then, not, you're not anxious? Not at all anxious. Mm, one more. I'll have one more. I've had four of these. And you have to tell our North Indian audience. Mm. I mean, I've kind of done a clumsy job of saying, this is like a pancake. But can you just tell us a little no, bit more about No, it's the same thing. This? It's simply the way the batter is spread when you cook it. So it's these are this is spread thin and this is spread thickly. It's delicious. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Yes. But so you're not, I'm not aware of a tattu dosha. Mm. This is the way in most I've had, Idli, I've had an idli like this. That's a Ramashiri idli. That's different. Okay. Idlis are steamed. They're not cooked on the. This is cooked cooked on the tawa. It's delicious. But it's um. In most dhabas, you ask for this, this is what you get. I had to specifically ask for in one. By the way, what do you eat typically when you're on the campaign trail? Well, frankly, there is nothing typical because um, most nights I get home so late that it's, I'm too tired to eat 
Mm. And, and I the take day? to whatever I've nibbled and in on the, the day? vehicle, people will give me bananas, grapes, yeah. oranges. So you're healthy uh, and you just keep to fruits and nuts? So I just, I, I nibble whatever I get. Mm. Intersperse it with lots of tea and um, occasionally indulge in a piece of chocolate or two. And that will be my uh, sum total of a dinner, essentially. Well, that's very healthy. <laughs> Unlike me who just had like four of these delicious batter pancake look-alike dosas. Now, are you anxious at all? Do you, think, do you think this is the toughest fight you had so far in Tiruvannathapuram? No, the toughest fight I had in Tiruvannathapuram was undoubtedly 2014. Mm -hmm. Because not only was there um, a formidable BJP candidate, yeah. not only was there a Modi wave, mm -hmm. when a lot of people bought into the narrative that, you know, uh, Gujarat Inc. was a miracle and that uh, the rest of India was going to be transformed in that way. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, there was a very malicious campaign against me over the death of my wife. I mean, got to the point where both my opponent's parties yeah. were going door to door saying, how can you vote for this guy? He murdered his wife and this kind of stuff. And that yeah. was really poisonous stuff going on mm -hmm. in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and you plowed through it. And I plowed through it, but that was my closest race. I won by just 15,700 votes. Yeah. Now, in a three corner fight, that's a respectable win, mm. but still, Given that I'd won by one lakh votes the previous election, yeah, and I went on to win by one lakh votes the next election, that was the one that was the toughest, the one in the middle. Now, today, um, I'm facing an opponent who doesn't have the same appeal that my opponents in 2014 had, because that was Mr. O. Rajagopal, yeah. who was a senior leader of both the Jansan first and then of the Bharatiya Janata Party here. Yeah. He had been a minister in the Vajpayee government. Um, they put him in the Rajya Sabha from Madhya Pradesh or somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And he, he served as Minister of State for Law and Minister of State for something else. Um, highly respected and liked person. Yeah. I, mean, I consider him a friend. Call him Rajayatan, which means uh, elder brother. Um, and he was genuinely liked by a lot of people. So there was a personal sympathy vote factor, which obviously won't be there for a, a newcomer like uh, my current BJP rival. But you know, there's this talk about the, you know Trivandrum or Tiruvannathapuram being a primarily urban seat, um, young population, <coughs> Rajiv Chandrasekhar representing the world of tech, also being suave and urban like yourself, a similar persona. <coughs> what do you say? Not true. I mean, I, I've done a great deal for the tech world, by the way, in Trivandrum. I can talk about that too. Yeah. But uh, Trivandrum is still a predominantly rural population. Um, there are seven assembly segments, four are urban, three are rural, but um, even in the, in the tough election I faced, for 2014, my majority is in the rural area, yeah. made up any BJP gains in the urban area. So, fearing defeat because of an urban setback is not really a logical conclusion to draw from that experience. Hmm. What are your challenges according to you then in this election? If you, no, no, do you, are how, would you how would you describe Rajiv Chandrasekhar as an opponent? Look, he's running a, a very professional campaign in the sense that he's had perfect. <coughs> yeah, it's chilly. No, the vada is chilly. I cough from that one. <coughs> Is that professional consultants engaged mm. all of the place and they're doing things which uh, not everyone has done before. Ah. But that also has its negative side. Thanks. Like one. Thank you. Mm. Which is that, for example, there's a video going around mm. of uh, a couple of these kids coming canvassing for our for Rajiv Chandrasekhar mm. in a flash. Um, we know about it because I've seen the video. Mm. And when the People in the flat ask questions back. The kids were completely at a loss and didn't know how to answer. Um, you know, they essentially trained in a rather limited script, and that's all they can go for. So, with a thinking voter like the uh, Kerala voter, that may not be enough. Um, the um, strengths, I think, you're right that he has. Uh, somewhat similar appeal to the professionals in tech world and so on yeah. that I would I, yeah. that I have enjoyed yeah. so far. Yeah. Um, 
But just shortly before you came here, the story of his affidavit broke, and I think that's giving him some perception issues in the constituency because um, a billionaire who structures things in such a way that he pays less taxes than a taxi driver. That doesn't sell very well in a place like Kerala, where we are pretty egalitarian and expect those who are fortunate to, to pay their share. Are you planning to make it a big central issue? Not personally me. Why is that? I've not even had time to um, do anything but, but, but you know, campaign. Um, my own party has made an issue of other things in the affidavit and that, that has become a thing. But the, uh, the tax thing that I've been seeing bits and pieces of all is all from private social media. Um, handles. I think um, what the Congress Party and the LDF complained to the Election Commission about was the number of concealed assets, um, or what they allege were concealed assets, and he denies. And that I think is something the Election Commission will end up sorting out, or will have to go to court, or whatever. I don't know. But as far as um, the tax thing is concerned, I don't really see any party taking it up. It's more a question of perceptions. And perceptions matter in politics, sir. Now, let's talk about how you would define him as an opponent. How would you describe him? No, this is not a particularly useful line of inquiry, but I'd rather not describe him or anyone else, describe myself and my work. I'll come to that. I mean, <laughs> we'll be talking about that. But let me put it differently. You like to use a word called, and please forgive me if I'm going to mispronounce this one because it's a complete tharurism, defenestrate. Yeah. <laughs> defenestrate. Anybody knows what that means? Like, firstly, I have to ask you before you tell us what that means. Do you actually use words like this in real life? Yeah, yeah. Or do you just do it to bug everybody else? No, no, no. And to show off? And to generally preen? No, no, no. Look, this whole thing started in college. And you went to the same college. Okay. So, I don't think I've used any word in in later life mm -hmm. that I haven't used it since Stevens at some time or the other. You use the word defenestrate in college? Absolutely. I mean, I never said defenestrate at St. Stevens College, I want to say. Because you're not Barkha and you are... Uh, uh, I'm not Shashi, I'm Barkha. Mm -hmm. No, no, because you are sort of, you reach, you reach out to millions. I was only at that point focused on the on the little Stephanian crowd I was addressing in debates and conversations, yeah. but yeah. So, so, so you've been talking, so defenestrate basically means what? Eliminate? To throw out of the window. To throw out of the window. Fenestra is So, so, so Rajiv uh, Chandrasekhar would be wanting to defenestrate Shashi Tharoor. I bet throw you out of ask the Trivandrum window. Right? Yeah, I'll ask him whether he wants to do that, but as far as I'm concerned, what I'm, um, I'm expecting that I'll have to do is to... Um, is to defend not only myself at the window, but also at the door, which is which is where the knocks are coming right now. I will say that um, when you look really officially at this election, there are three contenders. And I mentioned one poll um, to you. I don't think your camera was on, so I'll repeat it yeah. here, which is that the leading Malayalam newspaper, the Malayalam Manorama, ran yeah. a poll, which shows me winning by almost exactly the same percentage by which I won last time, which is about 11%. Yeah. Um, you got about 44, 44% of the vote. Last time I got 42, 42 BJP got 31, the previous time, and the yeah, Communists right. got 26. Right. In this poll, I'm showing at, I think, 40.7, so almost 41. Um, and the other two are both in the high 29s. I think Rajiv Chandrasekhar is sown at 29.8, and Panyan Ravindu is at 29.6, or something like that. So he's ahead, but not by much of the Congress. That, that's, the, that's the scenario as I understand it, uh, in that particular survey. Now, I'm not a big fan of surveys in India, so yeah. I'm not going to rely on that or count on that alone. Uh, to to, to um, explain anything, because the fact is that in our country, uh, surveys always run afoul. Sir. 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 Uh, oh. Surveys always run the risk of, uh, of, of of the sample not being accurately reflected oh. of the of the voting population. Uh, I remember the last election, one of the prominent newspapers, not the Manorama, yeah, yeah. ran a survey saying I was going to lose, and I won by lack of votes, which in a three-cornered contest is about as good as it gets. Yeah. So difficult to say how these surveys work, but nonetheless, um, our sense on the ground. I've been going around campaigning since the 10th of March when my candidacy was announced. Mm -hmm. Is that people? By and large, they're showing the same level of enthusiasm, support, affection, and um, uh, 
same trust in me as I've received on the, on the previous occasions. And in some places, uh, even more than before. So I'm not at all worried. This is an unusually long campaign by Kerala standards. My first election, the whole thing was done and dusted mm -hmm. in three weeks. This one, the from the dates in which the elections were announced yeah. to, um, to today, uh, no, until the 26th of April, for the communist candidate who was the first off the block, yeah. it will turn out to be a, like a nine-week campaign, which is crazy in Kerala. For the uh, for Rajiv Chandrasekhar, he was announced, I think, about seven weeks, uh, you know, one, yeah. one week or, or, or ten days before I was announced. And I've got the shortest span, yeah. which is only fair, I suppose, in some ways, because the um, incumbent needs less time to familiarize himself to the voters, uh, whereas the challengers need more time to get used to the constituency and so on. That's fair enough. But Rajiv um, and Pani and Rabindran have both been on the ground running. And, and I will say that because of that, thank you. Because of that, it's going to be important for me um, to, to, to do the same, to sort of uh, be working all the time, morning to night, mm. touching all the bases, even the ones of people who know me well and have known me well and have cooperated with me in the last three terms. Because you never know when that's going to be enough or not. That's, that's essentially the thing. Having said that, right now, the um, BJP appears, and I'm, I'm being very careful, appears to be ahead of the communists, and both appear to be well behind me. Uh, in the very first period of the campaign, I myself said, we well, look at the three-cornered fight, we're all in with the charts. You know? After a while, it seemed to me the communist campaign had not caught fire. Uh, and they seem to be running a rather lackluster campaign. Indeed, most of their attentions will be focused on attacking me, which seemed to me a slightly odd position to find myself in when we are both trying to unseat the BJP government in Delhi. But nonetheless, fair enough. That's what they've been doing. But, they've but been that's focusing. happening in Wayanad also, yeah. where they're contesting against Rahul Gandhi, right? That's right. What do you make of that? <clears throat> no, I think um, Rahul Gandhi is incumbent. He's absolutely entitled to defend his own seat. It's they who have to answer if they want to preach coalition dharma there, why don't they practice it themselves elsewhere, including here, when here I'm fighting a BJP opponent, when the BJP has come second twice, and the BJP is the most credible alternative to the Congress here, then they should actually be rallying around the Congress. But instead, they're not only campaigning again, but they're actually spending all their energy attacking me rather than attacking the BJP. You think they don't, you think that they consider you a bigger threat than Rajiv Chandrasekhar, and that's the point? Yeah, but the fact Clearly. is, what is the election about? Malka? It's an election, after all, for uh, uh, who's going to run the government of, of India in Delhi. It's not an election for who is the nicer guy in Trivandrum. So ideally, they should not have fielded a candidate against you. No, or against, against, or against, against, if they you. really believe, thank you, sir. Or if they really Rahul believe Gandhi. what they're saying about Rahul Gandhi, that you know we are allies, we shouldn't be fighting each other, then that argument applies in spades when the Congress is fighting the BJP. And I'm certainly not supporting their argument with Rahul Gandhi. I think Rahul Gandhi should contest and win as the voters want him to. But I am certainly contesting the argument that, um, the, uh, making the argument that they have no business to preach alliance dharma in, in Wayanad mm. and come here and undermine an anti-BJP candidate. That is what I am. Okay, we've spoken about the communists at, by the way, the comrade Sakhav Dhaba in Thiruvananthapuram. Mm. Highly, uh, deliciously ironic. Balaramapuram, actually, but sure. Uh, what is it called? Balaramapuram. Balaramapuram, but part of the Thiruvananthapuram constituency? Yeah. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about how food is so deeply political at this moment in this campaign. I thought when I called my program Dhabas of Democracy that I was just going to be eating my way through the heart of India. But in the last couple of days, we've seen the Prime Minister actually reference meat, as he called it, meat at the, in, at the time of Navratri or Sab. And he made it uh, sort of an example of how he believed that the opposition and the reference seemed to be to Tejasvi Yadav and Lalu Prasad Yadav were mocking Hindu sentiments by flaunting videos of mutton and fish. We're having a pure, by the way, vegetarian meal. I'm sorry, I happen to be vegetarian. Oh, you are so vegetarian. Ah, okay. I've forgotten that. But given the debate that the Prime Minister has triggered around food, what do you say? What do you say about this debate? I think it's most unfortunate because the most important characteristic of Hindu dumb as it used to be was live and let live. Mm -hmm. When Mahatma Gandhi, who revered the cow yeah. and and you know had that famous dream that the cow 
was was crying to him piteously at night. And that's why he stopped drinking cow's milk because he, he thought even the pain of milking the cow was yeah. unfair to her. Yeah. And so he uh, switched to goat's milk. Yeah. This Mahatma Gandhi, when asked, how come you're not calling for uh, uh, a ban on beef in this country? He said, how can I tell others what to eat? Hmm. He said, it's my personal decision. I will not eat it. I will not eat it. But I'm not going to tell Muslims they can't eat it. Uh, and that's our... our and it's our not others. only Muslims, right? Not okay, only beef Muslims, exactly. is a different debate. No, no, but, but, but I'm just saying it's the same logic. Non-vegetarianism is not only Muslims. It's the same logic for non-vegetarian food. Um, I am a vegetarian, have been since I was four or five years old. But my family was not. Uh, in fact, my mother thinks I discovered vegetarianism by accompanying her to a butcher shop in Crawford Market in Bombay and being revolted by what I saw. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is my own twins were brought up mm. to eat everything uh, because they were brought up in, in a place like New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and we thought life would be much easier for them to be vegetarian. And, and their mothers, half Kashmiri, half Bengali, so mm. meat eating Brahmins on both sides. Yeah. And wow. then what happens? One of my twins unilaterally turns vegetarian without any. <laughs> Any influence because I genuinely believe that I just shouldn't proselytize that people eat what they want to eat. Yeah. Now, there's an example of people finding their own uh, dharma, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to food. Why should Mr. Modi make somebody's food habits a political issue? It is every the Hindu says let everyone choose to do their but own let, thing. But let's look at the data. The Pew survey tells you that about what, 39% of Indians or somewhere there, 31 or 39, I don't remember exactly identified as vegetarian, but it says 81% do say that they have some restrictions on their meat consumption, which means either they don't eat a kind of meat or they have phases in the calendar where they don't eat meat or they have a day of fasting. And the BJP says the Prime Minister isn't making a point about meat eating. He's making a point about religious sentiment. He's making a point that Tejasvi Yadav himself said, hey, I released this video to provoke the BJP. We knew that they'd get provoked. And so on. So his point is about religious sensitivities. Well, okay, fair enough. But my point still is that why should somebody in the name of religion be sensitive about somebody else's personal taste? Mm -hmm. To my mind, that's what's wrong in some ways with the whole nanny state attitude that the BJP specializes in. I don't believe the government or the ruling party has any place in my bedroom, in my kitchen, or at my dining table. Mm -hmm. And the BJP doesn't agree. They feel they can make comments on all of these areas, who to love, what to eat, where to, how to dress, where to go. And I just think that this is wrong. I think it's, it's not how we used to be as a culture. Mm -hmm. And it's not how we should be in a modern 21st century liberal state. But Mr. Modi, unfortunately, is, is actually playing into the worst stereotype of the prejudiced uncle who is saying, you know, my way of doing things is the right way and the rest of you should actually respect mine. Whereas my argument is, his way is right for him, my way is right for me, your way is right for you, it's fine. You've been to my place, uh, I, I, you've had meat at my table, uh, I've not complained, I've, I've, I've encouraged my guests to eat what they want to eat. Yeah. And I eat what I want to eat and I don't eat what I don't want to eat. That's, it's as simple as that. I would say the same thing applies across the board in, uh, in, in public life as well, but that's not the way in which our Prime Minister and the ruling party seem to see it. Now, um, Shashi, moving from this whole sort of debate around food and personal liberty, uh, let's let's actually look at the Modi factor. You hmm. don't agree in this case with what the Prime Minister has said, but clearly all polls, since you've cited polls about, you know, showing you ahead in Tiruvannathapuram, there are other polls that show a likely third term for the Prime Minister. He has focused very much on the southern states this time. Right. Uh, they're hoping that this is going to be their debut seat in, in Kerala. He's made multiple trips to Tamil Nadu. Uh, how do you read the Modi factor? And do you actually look at it through the prism of a so-called North-South divide? Or do you, as Prashant Kishore argues, not underestimate Modi as a brand even here, even in the South? No, I, I certainly don't underestimate the brand of Mr. Modi. And in fact, I... I can see and admire those qualities in him that have obviously attracted voters in the course of the last 10 years and before that in Gujarat. His oratory is compelling. Uh, he, he picks up issues that resonate and I must say that he is a, he commands, uh, he's a commanding presence which I think is a reflective of a fine sense of theatre as well, right down to camera angles. So this is a man who, uh, who, who is consummate at what he's doing in that regard. Having said that, I'm not sure that it's, I'm not sure that it's enough because um, um, you've got to look at the overall experience of the Indian voter 
during the Modi decade, the Indian voter has found himself or herself in a situation where 10 years ago they were told Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas, creating two jobs, two crore jobs a year, uh, economy is going to boom, there are lots of opportunities for everyone. And what happened? What happened was that not only did they not create two crore jobs a year, but those who voted hoping for a job in 2014 still don't have a job in 2024. And what is more, in many cases, those who had jobs in small micro enterprises lost them because of demonetization. It was a Modi inflicted wound on the Indian economy. Subsequently, they abandoned that theme altogether in the 2019 election and fought with Pulwama, Balakot, 56 in chess, national security, and they won again. Now, that also has, a, has an expiry date, Barkha, mm -hmm. because you're looking at a situation where China has actually moved into our border areas. There are Ladakhi farmers who can't graze their sheep where they used to be able to. You've got 26 out of 65 patrolling points where both the Indian army and the Chinese army used to patrol, that right now only the Chinese have parked themselves in, the Indians can never go there. That's how we lost 20 Jawans were pushed off a cliff where the Chinese and the, Ch the Indians went to say, why haven't you moved yet? Now, this is the situation we're in. So how can Mr. Modi make national security a campaign issue? We would laugh him out of court because this is the embarrassment he's put in. But the fact finally, is... Finally, in 24, therefore, the last remaining option is Hindu Hudaya Samrat. Now, that has a limited appeal beyond his core constituency. And on top of that, the core constituency has already been maxed out in 2019. Six states, they want every seat. Three states, they want all but one seat. Two states, they want two seats. I mean, left, all, left only two seats to us. So the result is, in all these states, there is a grand total of 11 states, there's only one way to go, and that's down. If you ask them to point to where they can go up in seats, However much Modi appeal, Modi magic they may be, okay. the truth is, no, let me, let me finish. Modi's government needs just 32 seats to be lost for them to lose their majority. That's where they are. And you're looking at some startling numbers coming out of the existing survey, since you're quoting polls, any quote polls. Karnataka, last time he won one seat. The last poll last week showed 20 seats. The poll three days before that from another rival poller showed 17 seats in Karnataka for the Congress party. Oh. Telangana, last time we won two seats. Last two polls showed 10 and 12 seats respectively. Okay. Haryana, last time we won zero. Now it's showing five to seven seats for the Congress party. You're seeing stories like this in state after state. So what I'm seeing is the Congress going up and the BJP correspondingly going down. And these are all BJP held seats. So why the media has somehow uh, swallowed the Abki Bar Charso Par narrative when it absolutely has no basis in reality. And merely being seduced by Mr. Modi's uh, undoubted personal charisma is not, is not sensible. I genuinely believe that the BJP is in for a very rude shock in this election. Okay, we'll find out. North and South, weeks. exactly. We'll find out in a few weeks. I'm not a pollster, so let's not do a poll versus poll uh, debate here. But do you find yourself in a kind of ideologically lonely place? Because much of your party is seen to be lurching far towards, far too much towards the left. In fact, critics of the Congress say again and again that the Party of India's Freedom Movement now seems to be a party where the leadership is surrounded by, some people have even used the phrase, lonely lefties, okay? On the other hand is you, a believing Hindu, the author of a book which explains why you're a Hindu. Uh, but, but quite centrist on issues of national security comes from having been a veteran diplomat. When you called the Hamas a terror group, right? Uh, uh, which you did. Uh, no, I didn't. Hamas no, is I didn't. not a terror group. No, no. I, was be very, I was very okay, careful. Was an act I, of terror? I described what happened on October 7, I without said, using the name Hamas, as I said terrorists. Mm -hmm killed 1,200 innocent okay. civilians Sorry. and kidnapped 250. So an act of terrorism. And then in a subsequent interview, somebody asked me, are you calling Hamas a terrorist organization? I said, in India, no individual can make that determination. Only the government can. And I can tell you that neither the Congress government nor the BJP government has so far determined that Hamas is a terrorist organization. Therefore, I am not going to say that. Okay, so you think 7th of October was an act of terrorism, but you're not going to call the Hamas a terrorist group. Isn't that pre-verification? Not at all. That's been diplomatically precise. Okay. The, I, I'm not here to debate right now Israel, Palestine, Gaza. We can do that on another day. I brought that up as an example. That on the one hand, you have the communists targeting you. The communists are targeting you for this nuanced position that you have taken, a complex position that your diplomatic training has taught you to take. On the other hand, you have the right of centre that is going to say, Shashi, you just didn't go far enough. You were kind of apologising. No, no, but the BJP is also not called Hamas a terrorist. That's true. 
That so that's true. the point you've got to understand. Those of us who have served in government or I mean, or the BJP, I don't know, but the government, the, the government has not called the Hamas The terror. government has not. And so you have to respect that it's only the government that can do this. Let me stress one more thing, Barkha. The Congress is a big tent. Yeah. In terms of economics, I have been much closer to the Manmohan Singh, Mantek Singh, Aluwalia, Chidambaram line, which is a, 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 a very liberal economy, much more freedom for entrepreneurs and business people, but at the same time, a faith in social justice, that the revenues that come to the government that accrue from a dramatic growth in these sectors should be shared with those who are poor, marginalized, excluded, and that's why you have welfare benefits. That is the logic. I am not, therefore, somebody who would be called a leftist in Congress. I mean, in, in college, I was a Swatantra Party supporter. Swatantra Party no longer exists. But that's a classic liberal position is my position there. On national security, I'm more than center. I'm sort of right of center because on national security, I'm a sort of a, a, a peace lover who's been mugged by reality. I've seen a little too much uh, close up from my UN days. Good uh, and, and, and And I don't believe okay. that as an Indian, it would be responsible of me to overlook some of the genuine national security challenges we face. Okay. So I'm, I may be right of center on economics. I may be right of center on national security. But on Hinduism, you've got me wrong. What I've said and why I'm a Hindu is that I am a very devout, believing Hindu in the beliefs of Hinduism that Swami Vivekananda preached, okay. that Mahatma Gandhi preached, and that basically teach us that for Hindus, all ways of worship are equally valid. That we will not judge other people for their faiths because the whole notion when we move from the idea of the Nirguna Brahman to that of the Saguna Brahman, the Rishi said, all of you are free to imagine the divine, whatever way you like. That's why we have 330 crore gods. It's not that they're not gods, they're simply human ways of imagining the divine. But ultimately there is one and that is the Brahman. And so, by that logic, a, a, a Hindu believer will say that just as you are free to have as your Ishtadeva a pot-bellied figure with an elephant's head, and I may be free to have as my Ishtadeva uh, uh, one of the female images of, of the Shakti principle, so also somebody else who wants to have as their image of God a bleeding man suffering on a cross, that's perfectly fine. Vivekananda would not even say you're not a Hindu if you believe that. So this is the kind of all-embracing all accepting, rather, okay. all accepting Hinduism that I speak for, which has nothing to do with the Hindutva political doctrine of the RSS and the BJP. Okay, now since uh, it's going to be midnight and we have to almost, I think, we have yeah, to let yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, I've got an early morning start okay, tomorrow. Okay, but, but before you go, yeah. Shashi Tharoor, you've been a figure on national politics, on the international stage. Do you one day want to be the Chief Minister of Kerala? Is this, is this your next step in your political ambitions? Look, right now my only ambition is to win my seat and help propel my party and with my party, the India Alliance, into power in Delhi. Because I do believe it's better for India That's right to now. defenestrate this BJP government and to make I'm sure... I'm only smiling at defenestrate. Uh, yes. No, you are. Yeah. I'm just telling you it's better for India to defenestrate uh, this BJP government and replace it with a more But is your long-term plan, your long-term ambition to be the Chief Minister of Kerala one day? I have not ruled anything out. Okay. Because, not because I ever thought of it, I came into politics with a purely national international vision. But given the large numbers of very influential figures in Kerala who are insisting I start considering that, I have said, don't tell me now, let me wait till after Lok Sabha election. I will see what the future holds for me then, and then we can decide that's whether. That's almost this is, a yes. That's, I didn't say it's a yes, I that's didn't say almost. it's a but it's not a no. Okay, it's not a no, and that's a good direct clear answer before we say goodbye to you and thank you for uh, this dinner or 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 and i've eaten so much and you just nibbled at That's your food um some terrorisms terrorisms to end the evening one word that you'd use to describe your current state of mind calm calm that's not a terrorism what do you want me to what's say what's a terrorism for calm <laughs> it is it is certainly <laughs> Look, whenever people ask me for these long, elaborate words, I tell them the secret is just no one word. And what's that? Read. I said, the more you read, the more vocabulary you'll acquire, and you can decide how to use it if you want to. Okay. But no, my, my mind at the moment, I'm, 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 I'm not stressed. Uh, I don't see any cause for alarm or stress. It's, it's, a, it's a tiring, fatiguing yeah. election campaign. It's also extremely hot. Yes. Uh, we had a blessed respite yesterday afternoon with some rain. 
but otherwise we've all been really, really uh, enduring a lot of heat. And therefore, I will admit that for me, at this stage, it, it's, it's been taking a toll, but not in my mind. It's been taking a toll of my... So, uh, a terrorism to describe the communists? Lackluster, surprisingly. And, and even the sort of feeble attempts at attacking me, I don't think they lack all conviction. It's not particularly... Okay. And one were to describe your opponent from the BJP? Unconvincing. Okay, so we have three words, Shashi Thirur Kaam, lackluster for the communists and unconvincing for Rajiv Chandrasekhar. The voter will have the last word. We've been, he's been very patient. I had plates and plates of Rasam Vada, of Thattu Dosa, four of them. I'm embarrassed to say while you can see here on his plate that he's not even finished uh, his first one. Uh, if the camera comes closer, he was just nibbling oh, and that right, is right, just right, embarrassing. Right. Anyway, Shashi, good luck. I've been nibbling on my campaign vehicle as well. So good luck worry. to you and thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you Marka. so much. Have a good stay. Thank you. Namaskar and hello everyone. Welcome to a ride through the heart and the soul of India. क्योंकि जब इलेक्शन सीजन आता है तो कौन जीता कौन हारा कौन आगे कौन पीछे ये बातचीत तो होती ही रहती है पर इट्स आल्सो अ टाइम फॉर ट्रैवल एंड मीटिंग पीपल एंड गेटिंग टू नो योर ओन कंट्री बेटर सो वेलकम टू द ढाबास ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी वेयर एवरी बाइट टेल्स अ स्टोरी वेयर एवरी कॉन्वर्सेशन विल स्पाइस अप योर डे एक्सपीरियंस द मसाला द फ्लेवर द स्वाद ऑफ दिस इलेक्शन विद अस एज वी टेक a lovely a unique road trip from the south to the north of india traveling thousands of kilometers to bring you the flavor of this election